The message is all around us. Thin is good, fat is bad, and your weight is your choice. In spite of the pervasiveness of these ideas, obesity has tripled globally since 1975. In 1980, 108 million people had diabetes. Today, that number is roughly 422 million. But what is causing these numbers to increase? Many Americans are quick to judge people affected by these conditions by assuming they are lazy. However, using the social ecological model of health, it becomes clear that these diseases are primarily a result of poverty and racism. Type 2 diabetes is a disease caused by the accumulation of sugar in the blood instead of being used as fuel for the body. This is created by a resistance to insulin. In type 2 diabetes, the pancreas continues to make insulin to urge a response from cells. However, eventually, the pancreas will not be able to make enough insulin to turn into sugar. Eventually, the pancreas will not be able to make enough insulin to turn sugar into energy, leading to an increase in blood sugar levels. Body mass index plays a role in insulin resistance. This is why overweight and obese individuals are much more likely to develop type 2 diabetes. Many of the children who um, come to my office um, suffer from malnutrition. Um, so malnutrition just means not enough food or an appropriate food, calorie-dense food, um, that fills kids up because they might not be able to afford, or many times they cannot afford, um, healthy food. There's no Whole Foods in North Philly. There's no Acme um, close by to our practice. Um, many of the foods in our area are, are what we call obesogenic foods, or foods that actually predispose somebody who's eating it to become obese. And then if you are constantly having those obesogenic foods, unfortunately, you're more likely to be overweight. And the more likely to be overweight, the more likely you are to get type 2 diabetes. America has set up an environment that minorities were not meant to thrive in. The social determinants of health are defined as the circumstances in which people are born, grow up, live, work, and age in. One example of institutionalized racism that has led to inequality in our country is redlining. In 1934, when the National Housing Act was passed, what was supposed to help Americans afford housing turned into a detestable act of hate targeting black families. Redlining marked off certain neighborhoods as undesirable due to minorities residing there. These families would not receive mortgage or home loans, thus leading to a deterioration of their neighborhoods. We can see how this foul policy plays out many years later in the diabetes and obesity rates. There is no cure for type 2 diabetes, but patients are told that in order to prevent or manage diabetes, one must concentrate on their diet, exercise, and weight management. But not all of us have the ability to access and maintain a healthy lifestyle. Researchers like Amy Hillier found that racial segregation through neighborhoods play a major role on our weight. Black neighborhoods become a proxy for long-term disinvestment. And I think this is probably like the most important part of sort of what I've done. So when, you know, you have decades of housing discrimination, you know, redlining that it would affect businesses as well as residential communities, um, you know, job loss, um, you know, the, not the upkeep of the, the, the sidewalks and, you know, the parks and, and the schools, so probably, you know, maybe the most important part, you know, you're not investing those, then, then that's when you start to see, I think, chronic, chronic health conditions. Yes, it's because there's not a supermarket, right, that has fresh fruits and vegetables, but why isn't there a supermarket? In Philadelphia, disadvantaged or under-resourced neighborhoods have an effect on weight gain as their residents are more likely to have chronic stress and lack the time and facilities for physical activity. The characteristics of a disordered neighborhood are social and environmental disarray 
such as graffiti, vacant lots, abandoned or burned out housing, and unkept or dilapidated properties. Researchers found that residents of neighborhoods with a higher degree of disorder and crime may be less likely to spend leisure time outdoors and therefore be less physically active because they fear victimization or harassment. Not only do their neighborhoods lack safety, but they also lack nutritious foods. Low-income neighborhoods typically have small bodegas or corner stores stocked with pre-packaged junk foods instead of big supermarkets such as Acme and Whole Foods. It's proven to know that fruits and vegetables are better for you than sugars and other things like that and starches, but there's too much of that around because it's so cheap. And the connection between obesity and poverty is there and that the food accessibility of healthy foods uh, in this country and in many other countries has gotten worse over the last 40, 30, 40 years. It's unbelievable. Even then, the comparison is clear between supermarkets in low and high income neighborhoods. Not only are the foods priced differently, but the foods are also displayed differently. Cousin Supermarket, one of the few large grocery stores in North Philadelphia, make it easy to buy junk food in bulk. The majority of their meat and produce are already pre-packaged and wrapped in plastic. Although several miles north in a wealthy neighborhood on the same street, known as Germantown Avenue, lies the Fresh Market. The Fresh Market gives shoppers the option to wrap and choose their own products. The United States Department of Agriculture defines food insecurity as a lack of consistent access to enough food for an active, healthy life. In 2018, this issue affected roughly 37 million Americans. In the U.S., food is not hard to find. However, healthy food to maintain a healthy, active lifestyle is hard to come across. Caroline Carney, a University of Pennsylvania graduate, created these figures to show just how easily accessible junk food has gotten in Philadelphia by showing a variety of fast food restaurants in each neighborhood. In 2017, almost 40 million people in the U.S. earned incomes below the poverty line. Additionally, one in eight people lived in households with limited access to adequate food. Hunger Free America reported in 2017 that 21% or one in five Philadelphians were food insecure. This number was very similar to the city's poverty rate, which was 25.8%. This indicates the connection between poverty and food insecurity in Philadelphia. Now let's take a look at the connection between race and poverty. While poverty affects many, it targets minority groups the most. Why is this? How come in America we see minority groups as disposable, as people who do not deserve basic necessities such as healthy food? Not only is food vital for human survival, but it is also essential for development. Food itself is vital um, for nourishment, for growth, um, not just for height and weight, but also brain growth. It's also important for um, our what's called synaptic growth, where our brain connects to the rest of our body. It's really important um, to have a well-balanced, healthy diet, even for success in things like school, success in relationships. Um, you guys all have heard the word hangry. It's really true. You know, kids who aren't getting enough food to eat um, tend to come to school sometimes, you know, angry and uh, get labeled as a troubled kid or a kid who's having tantrums when they're young, when in reality they just didn't have food that morning before they went to school or daycare. Food insecurity affects us in ways that aren't just physical, but also mental. If we're thinking about things that are even beyond that, that we don't think about, it's how much trauma food insecurity can cause someone. 
So literally the concept that if you are not sure about how much food you're going to be able to get for your family in a course of a week, or if you're having to make a choice between buying your food or paying your electric bill, or if you're having to make a choice between buying your food or you know, somebody being able to get a step to pass to be able to go to work, those types of things, like that amount of trauma has a long-term effect. It can build resilience, but that's a terrible way to build resilience. During the coronavirus pandemic, the number of Americans who are food insecure is more like 54 million. During the months of February through May, many everyday functions went remote, leaving nearly 14 million people jobless. Racism has taken too many healthy lives through the environments in which our country outlined. So what are people doing to address this public health issue? Before the COVID-19 pandemic, there had been food pantries, community fridges, and other resources for families to use who were experiencing food insecurity. But they weren't well known, as food insecurity wasn't seen as an issue in America. However, the recent COVID-19 pandemic exposed food insecurity in the United States. It's not like it's new. It's been exacerbated due to the pandemic, but it's also exposed a reality that has long been here. It's made it impossible to ignore. Food pantries like Phil Abundance and Feast of Justice explain their findings during the pandemic. Every single county in Pennsylvania, food insecurity has significantly increased from the pre-pandemic rates. Um, in Philadelphia in particular, I think before the pandemic, the last time it was measured, 20. 18, uh, food insecurity had a rate of 16.3, and now uh, for 2020, Feeding America is projecting that Philadelphia's food insecurity rate is going to be uh, 21.8. Pre-pandemic, uh, we were a large food cupboard. One of the, we were the largest in the Northeast um, and one of the larger ones in the city. And at that time, we were serving 285 households a week. That was pretty consistent for about two years or so, we were serving about that, right around that 285. April of 2020, we served 1,500 a week. So it, it absolutely went through the roof, unbelievably. Registered over 1,000 new families to the program, and uh, we're seeing a lot of families that have never needed a resource like this before. Dr. Dan Taylor explains how the coronavirus has worsened the physical effects of food insecurity on many children. COVID, I've seen now more kids over this past year um, develop type 2 diabetes than I've ever seen before in my 20 years of practice. Um, kids gaining an incredible amount of weight, 60 pounds, 70 pounds in a year. It is deeply unjust that people's weight and health are dependent on the economic status of their neighborhood. How can we solve this public health crisis? Some hospitals, such as St. Christopher's Hospital for Children in Philadelphia, are already working with their patients' families to gain better access to healthy foods. So the healthcare system tries some innovative approaches at St. Christopher's, um, we give out free school lunches every Tuesday. It's seven days of free breakfast and lunches for kids that are healthy. Uh, we have a program called the Farm to Families program where we can write prescriptions for farm fresh foods. Um, that said, it sounds great, um, but parents have to come on certain days between certain hours. Um, it's much more complicated than just writing a prescription for food and having you know that magically appear in their refrigerator. It's not like that. The parent has to actually come to our hospital to get food. Um, we've been in conversations with an organization called MANA, um, which was set up to actually deliver food back in the 80s to people who were suffering from HIV and AIDS, and we're working with our insurance companies to actually have MANA deliver healthy foods to children who are obese in our practice. Um, healthy foods not just deliver, but also um, educate a lot of families on how to cook some foods that might not be familiar to them. In my practice, almost 50% of the children that we take care of, older than two, are above the 85th percentile for BMI or body mass index. Um, you're talking about thousands of children. Um, so you really need a big systemic approach that healthcare system alone um, can't do. While diabetes and obesity have been labeled as public health issues by the CDC, the government has done little to address it as a problem in America. 
Could this be because the majority of Americans it is affecting are seen as disposable? Possibly, but the government has made some efforts to address these health conditions. Efforts like the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, commonly referred to as SNAP, and Specialized Nutrition Programs for Women, Infants, and Children, also known as WIC, are steps put in place by the federal government to help combat food insecurity. People who need help through SNAP can contact their local SNAP office or reach out to local food banks to ask them about an application. People can also look online at the USDA SNAP information page, answer a few questions, and check their eligibility. Federal SNAP benefits primarily focus on households with children, as well as elderly or disabled members, whose income is up to 130% of the federal poverty line. This is typically a family of four who make no more than $2,633 a month. Able-bodied adults can only get three months of SNAP benefits during a three-year period if they do not work 20 hours per week. While SNAP was put in place by the federal government, different states can adjust the programs to meet the needs of their residents. Once approved, SNAP is sent monthly to users through an electronic debit card, which can be used to buy groceries at authorized retailers. There are over 238,000 authorized stores nationwide. Using the SNAP store locator, you can see which stores accept SNAP near you. WIC is specifically for low-income pregnant women, breastfeeding women, non-breastfeeding postpartum women, infants, and children up to the age of five. However, there are restrictions. In order to be eligible for WIC benefits, one has to have an income at or below an income level set by the state. These are the guidelines for Pennsylvania. People must also be declared at risk for poor nutrition by a physician, nurse, or nutritionist to receive WIC benefits. It should not be this difficult for people to receive healthy foods. This year, the government created multiple assistant efforts to help pay bills during the pandemic such as welfare or temporary assistance for needy families, rent assistance and eviction moratorium, and stimulus checks, which give people the ability to pay bills. The sentiment behind that is, we're not going to tell you how to spend your money, and we're not going to get into the nitty-gritty nitty of just how poor you are, but by virtue of not being wealthy, you're going to get money that you can spend any way you want. Um, that may be more successful than giving people targeted subsidies. These are steps in the right direction, but it is also crucial to think about the future. The heightened need that we're seeing today, it's predicted to last long beyond the end of the current public health crisis. So the government fundings and the interventions that we're seeing, um, they're going to need to be long term as well. I really hope um, that the experience, this collective experience of the pandemic and what we've seen will lead to long-term policy change. But there are also steps that we can take. Some of the things that we need to continue to work on is an understanding that, uh, that food is only one piece of it. We also can't be uh, leaving it just on the, the um, responsibility of SNAP. There's so many things that we need to be advocating for as a society that will help to actually fix some of the food insecurity issues. We need to be advocating for a higher minimum wage. We need to be advocating for affordable housing. We need to be advocating for a better healthcare system because those are the things that are the ones that, that kind of throw people into a level of poverty. Why is it that in America, it is extremely difficult to maintain a healthy lifestyle with junk foods being easier to access than healthy foods? Why is it that when a person gains weight, becomes obese, or is diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, society portrays them as lazy and offers little to no support? Is this another way for America to be racist? Black women are 70% more likely to be obese as compared to non-Hispanic white women. For families living in poverty, easily accessible obesogenic foods may be the best option for meals to save money. Community gatherings may not be possible. Staying indoors may be the safest option for people living in a crime-packed neighborhood. Parents are scared of um, sending their kids outside. Um, the homicide rate is higher than it has been in the past 40 years, so of course you'd rather have you know, a kid at home who potentially 
is at higher risk of obesity and type 2 diabetes than a kid who's not around for the rest of their life. This is why it is vital for us to keep in mind that maintaining a healthy lifestyle is not always feasible.